I'm Anna, and this story isn't just mine. It's about the life I shared with Michael, my husband, and how everything we built together slowly unraveled. We met in college, two dreamers with ambitions as high as the stars. Michael was the kind of guy who could light up a room with his laugh, simple yet charming, always with a kind word for everyone. We fell in love, graduated, and, as luck would have it, started our careers at the same company. Life was good, simple, and blissfully happy. Our evenings were the highlight of my days. We'd come home, cook together, and share stories about our work. Michael was a good listener, always interested in my day, my ideas. He was supportive, proud of our equal standing at work, our shared ambitions. Anna, you're amazing at what you do, he'd say with a smile. I love that we're in this together. But then, everything changed when Michael got promoted. It was a significant achievement, and initially, I was overjoyed. But with the promotion came a change I hadn't anticipated. Michael started to care more about appearances, about status. He wasn't the same man I'd fallen in love with. Slowly, his criticism began. First, it was subtle, a comment here or there. Why do we always eat the same meals? We can afford better now, he'd remark, pushing his plate away. I tried to adapt, to please him, but nothing seemed good enough. He began to critique my clothing, my shopping choices, even how I decorated our home. Why do you always buy the cheapest brands? We're not college students anymore, Anna, he'd say, his voice laced with annoyance. I felt a growing distance between us, a chasm that I didn't know how to bridge. The man I loved, who once found joy in our simple life, was now obsessed with wealth and status. One evening, after I returned from grocery shopping with more budget-friendly items, Michael's frustration boiled over. Anna, this isn't acceptable. You're still dressing and shopping like we're on a tight budget. You don't match my status, he said coldly, his words cutting through me like a knife. His words lingered in the air, marking the end of our simple, happy days. That was the moment I realized how much he had changed, how much our life had diverged from the path we once walked together. It was the beginning of the end, the start of a journey I never expected to take. As days turned into weeks, the strain in our relationship only deepened. Michael's constant critiques about how I didn't match his status weighed heavily on me. I missed the man he used to be, the one who found joy in our simple life together. But as his obsession with wealth and appearances grew, our connection continued to fade. In the midst of this growing distance, life threw us a curveball. I discovered I was pregnant. The news brought a mix of emotions, joy, fear, and a glimmer of hope that this might bring us back together. Michael's reaction to the pregnancy was surprisingly warm. His face, which had been etched with dissatisfaction for so long, lit up when I told him. Really? We're going to have a baby? He exclaimed, his voice filled with an excitement I hadn't heard in ages. For the first time in months, I saw a spark of the old Michael. During my pregnancy, he was attentive and caring, often checking in on me and ensuring I was comfortable. It felt like a breath of fresh air a brief return to the days when we were a team. When our son, David, was born, Michael's joy was palpable. Holding David for the first time, he looked at me with tears in his eyes. He's perfect, Anna. We made this beautiful boy, he said, his voice choked with emotion. The early days with David were a blur of sleepless nights and new routines, but they were also filled with moments of tenderness and joy. Michael, despite his busy schedule, tried to be there for David's first milestones. Watching him with our son, I saw glimpses of the man I had fallen in love with. With David's arrival, our relationship found a temporary peace. The arguments and criticisms subsided, replaced by shared moments of wonder over our son. It was as if David's presence healed some of the fractures in our marriage. I cherished this period, hoping it would last that maybe this was the turning point we needed. But deep down, 
I couldn't shake the feeling that this was just a brief respite, a calm before another storm. For now, though, I held on to the hope that our family could find its way back to the happiness we once knew. Life with a newborn was a whirlwind, and for a while, it seemed to bridge the gap between Michael and me. But as David grew and the novelty of new fatherhood faded for Michael, the old patterns began to resurface. Michael's work consumed him more than ever, and when he was home, his attention was more focused on showing off David than actually bonding with him. He would buy our son the most expensive toys and clothes, things a toddler would never appreciate. One evening, I found Michael online, browsing through a list of elite preschools. He didn't even look up as I entered the room. Anna, I'm thinking of enrolling David in St. James Academy. It's the best in the city, he said, not asking, but telling. I sat beside him, trying to keep my voice calm. Michael, he's just two. Do we really need to send him to such an expensive school? He finally looked at me, his expression one of disbelief. Of course, we do. He's my son. He deserves the best. But he needs time to be a kid, Michael. Love and attention, not just the most expensive things. I argued, feeling a familiar frustration. Michael shook his head, dismissing my concerns. You don't understand, Anna. It's about giving him opportunities I never had. This was our new normal. Conversations turned into debates and debates into arguments. It felt like we were speaking different languages. I longed for the days when our dreams and values aligned. The distance between us wasn't just emotional, it became physical. Michael often returned late from work, long after David and I had dinner. One night, when he came home at an ungodly hour, I couldn't hold back my frustration. Michael, it's past midnight. You missed dinner again? David asked about you, I said, my voice laced with exhaustion. He shrugged off his coat, weary yet indifferent. I'm the head of the department now, Anna. These late nights are just part of the job. But what about us, Michael? What about your family? I pleaded, hoping to reach some part of the man I married. He paused, his face a mix of fatigue and annoyance. I'm doing all this for our family, Anna. You and David are living comfortably because of my hard work. I wanted to argue, to tell him that comfort wasn't just about money, but I was too tired. It was the same argument, and I knew I couldn't change his mind. As I lay in bed that night, listening to the faint clicks of his laptop from the other room, I realized that our little family was drifting apart. My husband, once my partner in every aspect of life, was now a stranger living under the same roof, connected only by a shared past and a son who deserved better than this growing void between his parents. It was during one of those long, silent evenings that I made a decision. I needed to go back to work to find a piece of the woman I used to be before the distance with Michael grew too vast. The perfect opportunity came when a position opened up at my old company, the same place where Michael and I had started our journey together. Feeling a mix of nervousness and excitement, I decided to broach the subject with Michael. Michael, I've been thinking of going back to work. There's an opening in my old department, I said, hoping for his support. His reaction was immediate and strong. Go back to work? Why would you need to do that? I'm making more than enough for both of us, he replied, barely looking up from his laptop. I tried to explain. It's not about the money, Michael. It's about me, about feeling like I'm contributing, being part of a team again. Michael finally looked at me, his expression one of disapproval. You can contribute by taking care of David and the house, that's your team now. I couldn't hide my frustration. But I need more than that. I want to use my skills, feel professional achievement again. Besides, it's good for David to see both his parents working. Michael stood up, his voice rising. You going back to work, especially at my company, is not a good idea. What will people think? That I can't provide for my family? I was taken aback by his attitude. So this is about your image, your status? 
He ignored my question and continued. Look at yourself, Anna. You've changed. You've let yourself go since having David. His words were like a slap in the face. I felt my cheeks burning with a mix of anger and hurt. What do you mean, I've let myself go? You know what I mean. You've gained weight. You hardly take care of yourself. It's not a good look, especially not for the wife of a department head, he said, his tone cold and detached. I was speechless, my heart pounding in my chest. The man who once loved me for who I was now stood there, criticizing my appearance, my worth. And frankly, he added, his words cutting deeper, I would be embarrassed to have you working at the company looking like this. I will be ashamed at work for such an ugly wife. I stood there, frozen, as he walked out of the room. His words echoed in my mind, a cruel reminder of how far we had drifted apart. That night, I lay awake, Michael's words replaying over and over. It was clear now. The man I married, the man I loved, was gone, replaced by someone I no longer recognized. The days following Michael's harsh critique were some of the loneliest I had ever experienced. His words had cut deep, leaving me to question not just our relationship, but my self-worth. In the midst of this turmoil, an unexpected incident occurred that changed everything. It was a typical Thursday afternoon when the doorbell rang. I opened the door to find a delivery man holding a large, extravagant bouquet of flowers. Confused, I accepted the bouquet and the accompanying card, thinking maybe Michael was attempting an awkward apology. But as I opened the card, my heart sank. The words were like a punch to the gut. To the most beautiful and perfect woman in the world, with the most charming youth and slender waist, which can be embraced with two hands. The words mocked me, a stark contrast to what Michael had said just days before. I felt a mix of anger and humiliation wash over me. This wasn't for me. It couldn't be. It was then I noticed the mistake in the address. The bouquet was meant for someone else. As I stood there trying to process this, my phone rang. It was Michael's new secretary, a young girl who had just started working for him. Michael had mentioned her once, laughing about how she was still studying and often mixed things up. Mrs. Smith... I'm so sorry, I think I've made a terrible mistake, she said, her voice anxious. What mistake, I asked, though I already had an idea. The flowers, they were meant for someone else. I'm so sorry, I sent them to the wrong address, she admitted, sounding flustered. A cold feeling settled in my stomach. Who were they meant for, I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. The secretary hesitated. I... I don't know her name. I'm just asked to send flowers and gifts sometimes. Please don't tell Mr. Smith I called. After we hung up, I stood in the middle of the living room, the unfaithful bouquet mocking me from the table. The realization of Michael's betrayal hit me hard. I felt a mix of anger, sadness, and disbelief. Without a second thought, I packed a bag for myself and David. I grabbed some of his favorite toys, his clothes, and the essentials. I couldn't stay in that house a moment longer, surrounded by the life I thought we had, which now felt like a lie. I left a note for Michael on the kitchen counter. I didn't wait for him to come home to offer excuses or explanations. I took David, who was confused but excited for an impromptu visit to Auntie's house, and left. Driving to my sister's place, I felt a strange mix of relief and heartache. The life I had known was crumbling, but I knew I needed to get away, to find some space to think and to protect David from the fallout. That evening, as I sat in my sister's living room, lost in thought, Michael showed up unexpectedly. He looked frantic, a stark contrast to his usual composed self. Anna, why did you leave? Why did you take David? He asked, his voice tinged with a mix of concern and anger. I confronted him directly. Why? Maybe because of the bouquet sent to your mistress, mistakenly delivered to your wife. 
I said, my voice steady but filled with hurt. Michael's face fell. That, that was a misunderstanding. The secretary, she made a mistake. I swear, there's nothing going on. I looked at him, trying to find a hint of the truth in his eyes, but all I saw was desperation. A mistake? Is that your best explanation? Before he could respond, I pulled out a packet of photos and laid them on the table. Then how do you explain these, Michael? His eyes widened as he looked at the photos of him with a young woman, clearly more than just colleagues. Where? Where did you get these? He stammered. I hired a private detective. He's been very thorough. Did you know she's the wife of your business partner? I asked, watching as the color drained from his face. Michael looked like he'd been punched in the gut. You can't let these get out. It'll ruin everything, he pleaded, his voice barely above a whisper. I felt a bitter laugh escape me. Ruin everything? What about us, Michael? What about our family? He reached out, but I pulled away. Anna, please, I'm begging you, forgive me. I can fix this. But it was too late for apologies, too late for forgiveness. Forgive you after you've lied and cheated? I can't, Michael, I won't. I'm filing for divorce. And these photos, they'll ensure I get what David and I deserve. Michael looked defeated, his shoulders slumping as the reality of the situation hit him. Anna, please. But I had made up my mind. No, Michael, you've made your choice. Now I'm making mine. As he left, I knew that this was the end of our marriage. The evidence in my hands was more than just proof of his infidelity. It was the key to a new beginning for me and David. The road ahead would be hard, but I was determined to rebuild our lives, free from lies and betrayal. The following weeks were a blur of legal meetings and tough decisions. I had initiated the divorce proceedings, armed with the evidence of Michael's infidelity. Despite the turmoil, there was a sense of determination within me. I was fighting, not just for my own dignity, but for a better future for David. One afternoon, I met with my lawyer to discuss the details of the divorce. We have a strong case, Anna. The evidence you provided is more than enough to ensure a favorable outcome for you and David, she said, her voice confident. I nodded, feeling a mix of relief and sadness. I just want this to be over. I want to ensure that David is taken care of. My lawyer assured me, we'll make sure of that. You'll have custody, and with Michael's position, child support won't be an issue. As the days passed, the reality of my new life began to set in. I was going to be a single mother, a role I never anticipated. But I also felt a growing sense of empowerment. I was making decisions, standing up for myself and my son. The final hearing was a tense affair. Michael and I sat on opposite sides of the courtroom, the air thick with unspoken words. When the judge granted the divorce, citing Michael's infidelity, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. I was officially free from a marriage that had become a source of pain and betrayal. Outside the courtroom, Mikhail approached me. Anna, I... I'm sorry. I never wanted it to end like this, he said, his voice laced with defeat. I looked at him, seeing the man I once loved, now a stranger. It didn't have to be this way, Michael, but you made your choices. He nodded, a look of resignation on his face. I just hope one day you can forgive me, for David's sake. I took a deep breath. I'll always do what's best for David. But as for us, there's nothing left to say. Walking away from the courthouse, I felt a sense of closure. The divorce was not just the end of my marriage, but the beginning of a new chapter. I had stood up for myself, fought for what was right, and in the end, I had come out stronger. The finalization of the divorce marked the start of a new chapter in my life. It was a time of rebuilding, not just for me, but for David as well. We had both been through so much, and now it was time to look forward to a future that was ours to shape. One sunny afternoon, as David played in my sister's backyard, 
I sat with her on the porch, a cup of coffee in hand. You know, I never thought I'd be here, starting over like this, I said, watching David chase butterflies. My sister, always my rock, smiled at me. But you're not just starting over, Anna. You're starting fresh. There's a difference. You're stronger now, more aware of what you want and don't want. I nodded, feeling the truth in her words. Yeah, I guess you're right. It's just, it's all so overwhelming at times. She reached over, squeezing my hand. It's going to be okay. You've got this, and you've got us. Always. I smiled, grateful for her support. Thanks. I don't know what I'd do without you. As the days turned into weeks, I began to find my footing again. I returned to work, where I was greeted with warmth and understanding. It felt good to be back, to be productive and to engage with colleagues who respected and valued me. David, too, was adjusting. He missed his father, but we made sure he had regular visits. I wanted to ensure that, despite everything, he had a relationship with Michael. After all, whatever had happened between Michael and me, he was still David's dad. One evening, as I tucked David into bed, he looked up at me with his big, innocent eyes. Mommy, are you happy? He asked, his voice soft. I kissed his forehead, feeling a surge of love for my little boy. Yes, David, I am. And I want you to always be happy too. He smiled, a sleepy, content smile. I am, Mommy. I love you. I love you too, sweetheart. More than anything, I whispered, turning off his light. That night, as I lay in bed, I thought about the journey I had been on. I thought about the future, uncertain but promising. I had dreams to chase, a career to build, and a beautiful son to raise. The road ahead wouldn't always be easy, but I was ready to face it head on. As I drifted off to sleep, I realized that this wasn't just a new beginning. It was a chance to write my own story, on my own terms. And with that thought, I welcomed the challenges and opportunities that lay ahead, ready to embrace them with an open heart and a newfound strength.